Welcome to Fueled by Impact. Today's show is all about firsts, and you'll see why. First, let's talk about my guests. In 2018, Addie Gundry was changing her son's diaper on a dirty, uncomfortable changing table in a public restroom. When she came out, she told her husband, I want to make a better one. And that wasn't just talk like it is with so many of us. She went on to design something revolutionary, joined up with her co-founder and COO, Brittany Heiser, and together they have launched Pluey, the world's first and only self-sanitizing diaper changing table for public restrooms. It's powered by a patented UVC light system that sanitizes the changing surface within one minute after every single use. And unlike the hard plastic ones that you've probably seen for decades, their table is modern, it is comfortable, and it has other first-to-market features like stainless steel handles to hang a bag or backpack or a purse, and a retractable security strap. Pluey is just beginning to scale, and their tables are in public restrooms nationwide, including the Chicago White Sox Stadium. But there is so much more that's special about this story. Pluey is a women-owned business. It's founded by two moms who designed an awesome product based on their own experience out in the wild. They stand for health and safety, and they care deeply about social impact as they grow, including donating diapers for every single table sold to those in need. I'm so excited to get to share their story with you. They launched this business in a pandemic with little kids running around at home. And we talk about their journey, the good, the bad, the unclothed toddlers who show up on conference calls uninvited. Also, another guest made a surprise appearance. That's right, totally unexpected, but totally apropos. And you can catch that if you watch the video version of this episode. So without further ado, I bring you the co-founders of Pluey, Addie Gundry and Brittany Heiser. Sweet. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. I've been really looking forward to this conversation. So why don't we jump right in? What is Pluey and how did it come about? That's a good place to start. It's a big question, but Pluey is the world's first and only self-sanitizing diaper changing table for public restrooms. So that's a mouthful, but essentially, simply put, we are trying to replace Koala Care. It's a changing table everyone sees and notices in public restrooms, created in the 80s, very outdated, very uncomfortable, and most often compared to and always just said dirty, basically. So people really think it's dirty, and we've done a lot to try and change that with our table. What brought about the idea itself? When did when did this hit you? And just tell me a little bit about the actual origin then. So I have a almost four-year-old and almost two-year-old. Uh, and when my son, who's now almost four, was about 10 months old, um, he we were out for lunch at a fast casual burger joint up in Wisconsin, and he had a blowout right when we got there. Uh, which of course every parent has experienced, um, but it was really one of my first times being in public with him and changing his diaper. My husband went into the men's room and there wasn't a changing table. Uh, so right away I was sort of interested in that and surprised because I didn't know that that was actually a thing, that businesses today were still making that decision or or forgot to put one in there as assuming dads don't do diapers. Uh, and that's really insulting to both the dad and the mom or whoever is there with a child. And so I go in with Cooper, and I mean, I don't even need to explain it because everyone knows it was just dirty and it was uncomfortable. And my purse, which is like the one kind of nice thing I own as a mom, because everything else is like covered and spit up or whatever, is now on the floor and my stuff is everywhere. Um, it was just so uncomfortable. It's rock hard, which I don't understand. You know, when you're at home, you don't change your baby on the kitchen counter, right? It's like, why is this piece of plastic so hard? So I got back to the table uh, and I said out loud to my husband, I think we could make a better one. Speak of the devil. <laughs> ah, the baby monitor. <laughs> this, will be, this will be a first podcast plus monitoring a uh, baby. So then Britt, where do you come into the picture? How did this, how did the two of you guys get joined up? Yeah, great question. Uh, so February of 2020, a mom friend introduced us and I have a deep history in product development, innovation, um, and Addie was at the point where she had raised a significant amount of capital through friends and family and was ready to essentially, you know, start building prototypes, get into production. So we met for coffee. It was going to be just like a one hour coffee, which turned into five hours. 
and we left, we changed, or we took a picture in front of the changing table at the coffee shop's restroom. Um, and I knew just instantly, like this was meant to be, it was like one of those kismet moments. And, um, you know, at the time I was looking to go back into the corporate world. So I was starting to interview. I had resigned from a big job that had required me to commute back and forth to Minnesota. Um, I had been with the same company for 16 years and I, I was ready for a change. You know, it was just meant to be, I'd always wanted to start my own business and this was a great way to do it with Addy. Wow, that's, uh, that's awesome. And I, I have follow-up questions on that. But I think before, before that, question for, for both of you, uh, Britt, maybe start with you. Everybody's got a superpower. What is your superpower? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say like staying calm. Um, it takes a lot to get me stressed out. That's just how I've always been. Um, and I think, you know, starting a business, you know, there are some very stressful moments. I mean, even when we were at our first install, it's like, um, you know, sometimes it feels like the sky is falling or gosh, how are we going to move forward? But I would say my superpower is staying calm. And that goes to also being a mom, you know, <laughs> that translate, it translates into the personal life as well. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Addie? I think, well, Britt's going to laugh at this, but my, I think my superpower is the super spin. We can now call it Britt. <laughs> <laughs> a way, Brittany calls it the Addie spin, but taking sort of an idea, a problem, a sale, and finding a way to spin it to make it, to make it positive. And talk about being a mom is similar, but, you know, I think you're just constantly changing your goals. And if you can kind of spin it or pivot, that's a really um, big power. And so, you know, for example, if we're trying to sell 500 tables this year, and then we don't, but we show that within the Midwest, the region we're focused there are 5,000 locations we targeted and we captured 30% of them in six months. That's huge, right? So maybe we didn't get 500 tables, but we were able to capture 20 or 30% of this market. So I think it's just constantly trying to not make yourself feel better, but almost like, okay, here's the goal, but actually, you know, let's, let's rethink about why that didn't work and spin it to a positive um, and find sort of the, the silver lining in it. When you guys first got linked up and you had coffee and you both knew that's such a big step to take, to join, to become business partners. I mean, it is like becoming life partners. Bring that to life for me. How did you know? What were the kinds of things that you were looking for? and anything that you would potentially extrapolate from that in terms of advice for somebody else who might find themselves in that type of situation? I think, well, so for me, it was, it was, I mean, I was seriously like sitting there alone at this desk in my basement, like, uh, what's not like, who do I find? How do I find someone? And I always knew I needed someone and it wasn't a team right away. It was someone, um, because especially when I was raising money alone, that was the number one question that came up. Like, who, you know, how you, who's your team going to be? And then also recognizing that I don't have certain skill sets. And I think for every entrepreneur, that's the first thing they need to recognize and then find their counterpart, because I will never sit here and say to an investor or to anyone or to myself that I would be an accountant for our firm, or, you know, that I would be able to have a product development experience or excellence and be able to you know, manufacture this the way someone like Brittany can, because I don't have that experience, you know, there's just no way. And so I think recognizing what I do know and what I can do well, which is sell the product and speak to polluting, you know, really kind of drive forward the sales and marketing. That's what I love to do. That's what I wanted to do. And so I needed to find someone who could make the product and bring it to life. And so I mean, I often joke that I talk about Bluey and Brittany makes sure I have something to talk about, but it's really, I think, finding sort of your opposite in terms of experience, but then someone you're very sort of like connected to in terms of personality. You know, and I would say, I think what's really helped us um, is the fact that we didn't know each other before. Mm -hmm. So there was like no history, like no baggage. You read about, you know, famous co-founders and they end up kind of divorcing and kind of the company is, is jeopardized. Um, but I think that's one thing that really helped us. And then also like we ended up like bonding on like such a different level as moms. So there was also an opportunity. I mean, starting a business like during a pandemic, like there's nothing that will accelerate a relationship faster than like 
trying to pull that off while you know having your kids running around at home. So I think we were also able to, you know, work really quickly. Um, you know, and we talk a lot about the two of us, but we also had a team behind Cluey. We hired a consulting firm that really helped with engineering, procurement management. So it's also finding people who can move quickly with you. Um, and then the last thing I would say is, um, you know, some people try and go about a business, like starting a business alone and going through the past year with Addie, I can't imagine like not having like somebody to wake up and think about, you know, Pluey every single morning and then go to bed thinking about Pluey. Like there would just be as a founder, you know, I feel like there would be some moments of like loneliness. So if somebody is thinking about starting a business and really just going at it like as a solo person, you know, I think you're missing out on the opportunity to have you know, kind of your right hand man or woman. Yeah. And I think with, you know, for me too, for, for so long, it was, it was me alone, but with my husband and that was great. Right. Cause he was supportive. He understood what I was doing, but what I slowly sort of discovered, cause he has a job of his own, right. Um, that, that, you know, for, I, like he didn't understand it the way Brittany did, right? It was like, I would tell him something and he's like, well, what about this? And it just, I love him if he's watching ever, but it was like, it just was sort of annoying. It was like, no, like you just know, like because of that, you just don't get it, right? It was like, I needed someone who was just in it with me day to day because it was, it's just, you can have family friends to support you, but like actually having a co-founder who is making decisions with you is very different. I think than like just a support team and even advisors and board members who are amazing, um, but still just not in that like day to day that you just need. I mean, it, it's scary making decisions that you don't know if it's the right decision and at least having someone who's just as educated and just as up to speed as you making it with you is this added level of confidence during a period of time where like, we're not confident about anything because it's just <laughs> scary, right? So. Yeah, I mean, it moves so fast. And just to try to keep somebody up with, I mean, you can even just in one day go through so many different thought processes and come to new realizations and yeah. to catch somebody up in that very short period of time is hard to do, especially if it's then you space it out, it's days, it's weeks, whatever, that, that it does become a real challenge. So why don't we, I wanna take a quick little detour because I wanna dive a little bit into you guys as people, starting with maybe a little bit of your background. Yeah, I know you guys share it up front, but um, maybe take me on your journey. And Britt, you, you mentioned, I'll start with you, cause you talked about how you'd been in a, a, a corporate, uh, environment for a long time. You knew you were ready. Can you just take it, take me on the journey all the way up until kind of what brought you to where you are now? Sure. And I'll, I'll, I'll start with like how I got my first job because I got my first job and I ended up <laughs> there 16 years. I had some great experiences there because even though I stayed a long time, which was really rare, um, you know, for somebody my age to, to stay at one company for as long as I did, but I had amazing mentors. I had a leadership team that saw potential for me to kind of pivot throughout the company and have new experiences. So whether it was product development, I spent some time in sales, had a position in marketing, and then I got to essentially manage a company that was acquired. Um, so I got to experience that like integration of a small business uh, and then the parent company at the time asked me to transition over to uh, essentially managing a small fishing boat business. But, you know, at the time I was commuting with a one-year-old at home. I was basically getting on a plane, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday um, to Minnesota. Um, that was very hard on my family. And I at the time, there were some things going on with my extended family as well. My grandma was diagnosed with cancer and there was just like this inner turmoil of this just doesn't feel right. Like I need to prioritize my family. And I'll never forget like having the conversation with at the time the VP of HR and I just, you know, my like I had tears in my eyes and I just said like, this isn't right for my family. I have to make a huge life decision. And at the time it felt like it was the biggest decision in the world. Like in, um, in hindsight, it was one of those moments I'll never forget. Like I had to make that decision, which seemed like the hardest, you know, I'd ever made, but it was the best decision. It was the right decision. 
And I would never have met, you know, Addie, like Pluey would not, you know, be in my life today. And it was one of those, you know, pivots that I think a lot of people either say, you know what, I'm just going to stick it out. Maybe like my personal life will suffer, but I'll stick it out. And you never know like what consequences um, will result of maybe not making that big decision. And I remember my mentor at the time, she said, you know, Brittany, this is going to be one of those moments where, you know, 20 years from now, you're going to be presenting to like a room full of women. And you're going to say like, you're going to talk about your experience and maybe that'll motivate like someone else to make that, you know, that life decision that will drastically change, you know, your, your trajectory. And the actual leap itself, that moment, what would be your advice to somebody who kind of hits that point and knows that it's time for a change, but you know, fear, doubts, all those things are probably raging at that moment. Yeah. Trust it like trust was such a big part of it. And it was like trusting that, you know, things will work out trusting financially. Cause it was like a big financial decision. My husband was just kind of like, all right, let's do this. But, um, you know, we'll be okay financially. So it was just like trusting that, you know, whatever was going to happen in the future, it would like right size my career path and that financially, you know, things would work out, even though, you know, maybe like those six, 12 months that I wasn't going to work was going to be a little bit scary, a little bit tight. Um, and then also just knowing that people would support my decision regardless, like ultimately, you know, there was a lot of fear wrapped up in the judgment. Like here I am one of the only females in this position you know, am I going to be that story of like, well, we gave this woman a shot at this big role and she couldn't handle it because she's also, you know, a mom. So there was a lot of fear too, of how is this going to change the perspective of other people in my company about offering women that same opportunity that they offered me. So there was, gosh, like up until this moment, like talking about it out loud, I didn't quite realize like how much was kind of wrapped up in just, is this going to harm other opportunities for females behind me? Yeah. There's that's like a lot of layers to yeah. that moment. You also, you mentioned something that I, I wanted to go back on because you said um, the the kind of the corporate environment and the pace and, and so on. Wait, can you unpack a little bit where you were going with that? Yes. Yes. So just, you know, um, being involved in a startup, you know, there's just this such a refreshing um, new way of working where it's like, we're making decisions so quickly. And while it seems scary at times and not having like the layers of approval, you know, it's just this opportunity to make decisions quickly, um, really impact a business on such like a meaningful level. And then there's this beautiful balance of lifestyle. You know, Addie and I, we have this great understanding of like, we're dropping our kids off at school or like we shut down at 4 PM and we go pick up our kids like in the corporate world, I remember I was, you know, working at the office till 9 p.m. at night, like working on a presentation for a board meeting or an executive level meeting. Um, and we just have this wonderful understanding of like, we are moms first, we have to prioritize our family. And, you know, if an email needs to wait till the next day, like that's fine. So I would say the corporate structure, you know, Mike, as you've experienced as well, there's this level of just like you're available seven days a week, 24 hours a day, no matter what. And we are establishing a different culture where we want that, that true life balance. Yeah, that is so awesome. It resonates 100% with me. It's a challenge. I think the bigger a company gets, there's two dimensions to it from my standpoint. There's how the company grows in uh, and creates its culture and does it do it intentionally? Is it a conscious decision? And is it the type of culture that prioritizes the kinds of things that you fit into? But then there's also this other thing that I think uh, as intentional as you can be as things grow, there are more people involved. Those people have their own priorities they have their own goals. There's mm -hmm. always going to be somebody who's willing, like the job is their life. They're maybe don't have a family or they do, but they're workaholics or there's, there's all these, and you get that mix of all this collection of different people. And it's very hard for 
what spits out of that to be something that necessarily aligns with your life situation. So you're forced to kind of just fit in to whatever that is. And I think just in general, we've seen cultures shift over time with just being always on, trying to get more out of people and whether or not that's conscious, it just starts to kind of happen and snowball on its own. Yes. So, well, thank you for, for giving me all that. Addie, let's talk about your background. Yeah, so uh, my background is not traditional, not corporate. Um, so I have always had sort of, I moved around a lot um, within the same industry, but I always was sort of um, fearless in that, I guess, for lack of better words. My husband actually calls it an accidental career. It was sort of like it just kind of kept working its way out. Um, so I've always been um, very much a risk taker, I think, and that that's helped sort of to get to where we are here. But um, I actually, you know, starting back, I dropped out of college. So I was a sophomore and decided I wanted to go to culinary school. Uh, this was over 15 years ago when the Food Network sort of barely existed. You know, maybe there were a few famous chefs, but they were Emeril and Martha Stewart. It was not, you know, you couldn't have a YouTube channel or anything like that. And so <clears throat> it was a very kind of bold decision without a lot of support. Um, and so my parents were sort of confused. Why would you leave a good school? You're a good student. The crazier part too was that I didn't even want to be a chef. It was that I just loved food and I knew that there was something I could do with food, but I had to learn how to cook. Uh, and that was the first step. And so I was able to leave school, uh, go to culinary school, and then following my culinary program, begin working in fine dining right away. So I worked for Daniel Baloud for a year in New York, uh, then opened Thomas Keller's restaurant in California ended up going back to New York to open another one for Thomas. And that's when I started to realize that truly I did not want to be in the kitchen. And so here I went to culinary school to go be a chef or to be in a kitchen. And it was just really not actually what I wanted to do. Uh, and so there wasn't a lot of opportunity for me because, you know, again, this was a while ago when it was really kind of cooking or, or maybe editorial. And so a dream of mine would be to work for Martha Stewart, for Martha Stewart Living and her magazine, but I didn't have a college degree. Uh, and that was important too back then. I think even now today, things have changed a lot where maybe it wouldn't have been, but getting into a corporate situation where stuff like that does matter and people care about these things. I was sitting there thinking like, wow, okay, I, I now have experience with food. I could go and do really well working for Martha or working somewhere, but I don't have a degree to get in. Uh, and I, I was very lucky that um, my mentor, which was Thomas Keller's wife, um, did get me a job, Martha Stewart. Uh, she ended up knowing someone there quite well. And so I began working for Martha and I went back to school. So I was about 25 or 26 and started going to NYU at night. So I worked, I went there Monday through Thursday uh, and we're there it was classes in person and then did the rest online. So graduated with a degree I did graduate, but with a degree that I was not really something I needed to pursue, but wanted to um, in my late 20s. And so a very sort of non-traditional educational background and then uh, experience with food. So I was working for Martha. I loved it. I loved her. Uh, but it was sort of time for me to maybe do something more creative. And so I that's when I started working at Gravity Tank which, to develop food products. I was working there for a while. I loved it. Uh, but really... Um, kind of wanted to, I don't know, I think I just always had this idea of being, um, doing something on my own. And so I think like working for Martha was amazing. Developing food for Starbucks is so cool, right? And, and working for Thomas Keller and being behind, I was always behind the scenes and I always wanted to be the person in front. And so, uh, and I don't know why really, as I'm saying this out loud, but it was just, I was always working for someone and doing really cool things that then they could celebrate. You know, seeing my work in her magazine is amazing, but it was her work, right? It was like, here's Martha's party. And it was kind of like, I kind of made that party, right? You know? And so um, I started to really think about how I could be my own person in the culinary world. And so I began competing on television. I was on Cutthroat Kitchen twice. So won this crazy TV show, which then brought me to um, their big flagship show, which was the Food Network Star. And I competed while I was pregnant with my son. I was sequestered in Los Angeles for almost two months uh, and to, to film this show. Wow. I began, after that, began writing cookbooks and published a series of 12 with St. Martin's Griffin. So really was sort of developing myself in the culinary world 
And that's when I had my son um, and I had a dirty diaper change. And like within the blink of an eye, I really thought, okay, like this is sort of what I'm meant to do. And I think there, you know, speaking of risks, I think for me, it was so personal that I wanted so badly to build myself in the culinary world and become sort of a personality, which nowadays is also very hard to do because everyone wants to be a YouTuber, a blogger or whatever. Um, and so I think this was the right move because I probably would not have made it um, big. But anyways, I think there was this big risk of like, I had spent so much time sort of proving myself in this space and I was just going to give it all up, right? To go do baby changing tables. And I often sort of even say to Britt, like, you know, I still feel the risk. Like, what if Pluie doesn't work? Like, yeah. am I going to go back to a kitchen? Like, what is my skill set, right? Is it cooking? I mean, what would I do if this fails? And I think that's a very common feeling or theme for founders and entrepreneurs because they're usually leaving something behind that is different. You know, I think a lot of people have ideas that don't exactly just align with their career, right? You know, yeah. Brittany too, like she, of course, she could maybe go back to a corporate job, but, you know, what are our skill sets we're learning as founders and how do we, also keep that in mind as we think of the future, because I do think too, it's like, whatever happens with Pluie, of course it will succeed. But, you know, there was a big risk of like, what will we do if this doesn't work? And I think a lot of people feel that way. So both of you guys talked about the risk and just the, the fear, maybe talk to me about right now, if you're looking back over the last year of the journey, you're at home <laughs> for a lot of this amidst the pandemic, trying to get something off the ground, trying to juggle being a parent amidst all of that. What's been the biggest struggle throughout that period of time for each of you? I think for me, it's so personal. Like it's just Pluey is like our baby. And so the struggle to balance between that and the kids, but then also now I think the struggle for me got much more challenging when it became announced and real. For a while, it was fun. It was like, we were kind of doing this behind the scenes and people didn't know, right? And I think once it became real and we announced it personally, so my friends from high school knew and my my mom's friend knew, or, you know, like it became more out there. I feel like the, the struggle became so much more, the pressure became so much more real. Like this is out there, people know what we're doing. And we don't want to fail. Uh, and I think that's been a big sort of pivot over the past year of when we, for a while, people didn't know we announced and now it's just like out in the open. Um, and then just really juggling that with the kids, obviously, you know, I think everyone has, has um, families they have to sort of incorporate into their work life and then vice versa. And Brittany and I do a really good job, I think, um, of being moms first. And that's something we talk about a lot is being moms first about no schedule shaming, no calendar shaming. Like if you have to go early for your son's dentist appointment, it doesn't matter. Like that's not something that should be a problem, but um, but it takes a lot of work to feel that way and to do that, you know, cause there's moments where it is like you resent yourself or like, God, I know I have to go to the dentist appointment, but like I have so much other stuff to do too. And so I think just like trying to compartmentalize that and not shame yourself for being so busy. For me, it was really just like taking care of myself. So it's like, I noticed, you know, there were a couple of months where like my workouts really lagged or, you know, I wasn't reading as much and it took me a while. And I think, you know, Jay Worthy on your, one of your podcasts, like really spoke to just, you know, taking care of your physical and your mental health. And I'm not like an early morning riser. I never have been. I'm like kind of the night owl. I like the clean inbox, like at the end of the night, like those like quiet hours after my son goes to bed. Um, but I got into like a good groove of even if it's like 30 minutes before like our son wakes up to like have that cup of coffee, you know, just have some quiet time. Um, that has really been a game changer. Mm. Um, because as much as I like to say my superpower is staying calm, you know, there, there are moments that are, are pretty stressful. So it's like taking care of myself because I think, especially as parents, as moms, there's this tendency to prioritize everyone else. And we just, you know, we have to figure out those ways to keep ourselves, you know, sane and healthy throughout this process. Yeah, completely. So uh, I want to go back to two different things that both of you guys have talked about. So the first one is this fear of failure. And Addie, you were talking about your story of, you know, what if Pluie doesn't work out? What do I go back to? So there's clearly a fear 
there that I think everybody feels going into this type of transition and that doesn't go away. You know, I'm mm-hmm. sure you both feel that way as confident as you ever can be on the journey. You always are still having the back of your mind. Well, what if something could happen? I mean, we all know things are unpredictable, so that's never going to go away. So can you just bring to life a little bit for me? How did that manifest and how did you move through it? And is there anything that you could offer to anybody else who feels that that might be helpful to them? Yeah, well, I have not moved through it yet, so maybe I don't have advice. But what's interesting, I think, about my fear of failure is it does not relate to financials or to the future or to, you know, I did talk about what would I do if this didn't work? Would I go back to the kitchen? And all of that's very real real for my family. It's not as though if I fail, I can't work, right? I will, I would need an income. So it's not as though there's a safety net where this is fun. And if it doesn't work, we'll be fine. You know, so there is this fear certainly of, you know, I need to provide for my family and, and this is sort of an expected thing for us. But that doesn't worry me. It's interesting. So what worries me is much more about the pride about that, you know, investors are friends and family. And that's something that's like I've had to get really used to and still am not. I really didn't want in the beginning to bring in friends and family because I thought, oh, my gosh, why would I ever ask my neighbor to invest? Like, that's so weird. And, and, you know, that's really normal in the startup world. And you're not asking them for money. They're, you're giving them an opportunity. And if they believe in the product and in you, you know, it is a big opportunity for them. But I think there's still some very like uncomfortable feelings sometimes around having other people's money um, banking yeah. on this. And that's interesting. Um, and then also just really this fear of like the pride. I mean, my gosh, it's like, there are these highs we have of like seeing in my in-laws like, tell all their friends at a dinner party about what we're doing. And like, that is an amazing accomplishment and feeling that like, they're so proud of this. And so, and even my kids, and it's like, I think it's so, my fear of failure is so deep rooted in like, what would people think if like one day it's just like, hey guys, we're closing down shop, it didn't work, you know? And that is like very paralyzing at some points. And I think what keeps us through it again, back to finding a co-founder and a person like I couldn't it would be very hard to feel that alone of course my husband feels this of course my family would you know but having someone who has these similar feelings it really keeps us driven daily because it's like we know what we're working for and towards um and I don't know it's tough I don't really have advice because I think it is just really hard um but you have to also just celebrate the wins. I think like it's really easy to feel the lows and the downs. And like when a customer says no, and it's a big customer, not to then think, okay, is Target said no, that means everyone else is going to, because that's not true, you know? And I think really trying to not focus on the negative, but learn from it and then really focus on, you know, again, we have had so many big and little wins that we sort of got, you know, desensitized to. We used to be like, oh my God, this is amazing. This person wants to meet. And now we're like, oh, whatever, like the president wants to meet you. Who cares? Like about, you know, it's like, we just kind of, you kind of get hardened by it. And so I think we have to remind ourselves, um, staying positive and celebrating the wins will help kind of combat and get those feelings of failure out. Like it's very easy to have a negative thing happen and then go towards failure versus having something positive happen and ignore it. Like you need to really sort of focus on those. Mm. Yeah. And Mike, I was going to say, you know, just probably the best advice is don't letting that, don't let that fear paralyze you use it as motivation. Like to Addie's point, a lot of times, like we use that sense of like, we cannot let this fail because of our investors, our advisors, So in turn, use it as a motivator. And I think, you know, celebrating those daily successes is key. You know, Addie and I, like, we just really try and find every day, like something to celebrate where it's like, it's an exciting email or a great idea or, you know, a compliment from a customer. You know, how do you really focus on the positive? I would also say Addie and I are like two really inherently optimistic people and, I think a lot of times, you know, as somebody starting a business, they have this sense of optimism that, you know, is hard to come by. And I think that has like played in our favor. And Britt, what about you in terms of fear? Is there something specific that you feel like is the texture of your fears more than other things? Going back to corporate. Uh, no, I mean, honestly, you get it's, another job. yeah, yeah. Like, honestly, like it is just now that I have found 
you know, this kind of like new life of, of being able to like shut down from 4.30 to, you know, 7.30 or like the understanding that like that, that email can wait, you know, one more hour that I, I do have this fear of, of gosh, like, um, you know, going back into corporate and um, I would say, you know, I would go to like women's conferences and there'd be this whole discussion of like balance, like how can you find balance? And there has always been that one woman, that executive that would stand up and they would say, there's no such thing as balance. You're either doing like, maybe this week you're like, you know, 80% your career and 20% your family. And I was always like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. But now that I've gotten this taste of kind of the startup world um, with Addie and working with other, you know, parents with moms that have this understanding of family first. I'm just like, gosh, I can't go back to that culture like ever again. Yeah. I think balance is like, is really different too than like doing it all well. Like, I think there's this expectation of like, we have a good balance. That doesn't mean we're thriving in every aspect of our life, right? It's still a struggle. And so I think that's what's like, hard as a, a working parent too, is that it's like, we may have a good balance in that. Like I can sign off at four 30 and go get my son, but like I was running out the door and I forgot his milk and he cried the whole way home. Or like, you know, it's just, I think like balance versus like thriving in each sort of parts of your life is still really hard. And when you're juggling a career and a family, like you just still have those moments personally, where you don't feel like you're doing either one, per, you know, well, because it's like, because you're still trying to juggle it. Um, and I think that's something too that is like good to keep in mind. And and someone once said to me, actually, it was Lisa Gersh, who was the CEO at Martha Stewart at the time. She now runs Goop, but we were having breakfast and she said, I'm three things. She said, I'm a CEO, I'm a mom, and I'm a wife. Like, what are your three things? And you can be, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister. Like, what are the things that are you? And she said, some days I'm a really good CEO. Like I kicked the ass at the board meeting. I was just like cruising all day, but I missed my son's soccer game and I forgot my husband's dry cleaning on the way home, right? Like you just kind of have a, and then some days I'm really good at two things. Like I kicked ass at the board meeting. I made it to the soccer game on time. And then I forgot my husband's birthday cake. It was his birthday, right? And he's like, she said, and then there's these days where you are all three so damn well. Like you kicked ass at the board meeting, you made it to the soccer game, you got your husband a cake, you surprised him for his birthday. And she was like, you don't have to have that day every day. And you're not going to, like, you have to kind of come to this realization that you are these few things. And some days you are awesome at all three. And most days you kind of get one right. And like, that's okay too. And so that doesn't mean you didn't balance it well, or you don't have a good work-life balance. It just means like, I think a lot of times moms and dads have this idea that they need to be really good at all three or four or whatever you are every day. And that's just not realistic, you know? And I think kind of understanding that too, like Brittany and I have the schedule and flexibility and grace that we give each other to be able to do those things that we are, but also like recognizing that that doesn't mean we're going to be awesome at all of them every day. And I think that helps to kind of remember. Yeah. It resonates a hundred percent with me. So two minute break. I've got a crying baby. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh so sweet 10 months old we had we had a call a, last week where we had a bunch of women and we had a, a naked kid show up on our webex <laughs> <laughs> we've seen it all at this point we've seen it all well i think it's hilarious that of all the the podcasts to do yeah uh, yeah <laughs> it's this one agree <laughs> that, uh that she makes an appearance <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Oh, look at that smile. <laughs> so I apologize. I was not expecting Don't this. Worry. I... No. That's what that's what the benefit is of Fluey. No this need to is, apologize. This is you guys you guys have nailed it. And actually what you said about the just the ability to kind of control the schedule. A lot of people I think go into this and think, you know, I'm gonna be working all the time, it's crazy. You know, a lot of it's a lot of the scare tactics that I know people will give yeah. about starting a business is, you know, it's going to own you. You're never going to have any time for yourself. 
But one of the things that people don't talk about, the autonomy to, to be able to dictate you know, what you do and when. And so even if you're working just as many hours in a given week, you know, from week to week, it can vary from day to day it can. You know, we also say like, and I think it's really common for most entrepreneurs to feel this way, but like people are like, oh, you must work around the clock. And we say, we don't work around the clock, but we think around the clock. And that's really true. It's like, I don't have to be at my computer sending emails to be constantly thinking about like a new idea or something. I think when you have your own company, it's just, you're constantly thinking about it, but you can be thinking about it at the pool with your son. Like it's, you know, you're just, you're very, it's very much a part of you, but it doesn't mean you have to be sitting at your computer answering emails. And so I think that's something too. It's like, it is consuming, but not necessarily in a sort of like handcuffed way, I guess. Yeah. So um, we've got a few minutes left. Can I just ask you, wh- one of the things I think is really inspiring about you guys is, is the fact that you're both moms, you're both doing something that I think is pretty rare for people in your, your situation. What are the myths that you could potentially dispel and any advice that you could give? Yeah, I would say the, the big one is just what you guys described of like starting a business that's just going to be so consuming you're going to be working, you know, 24 hours a day. Like, um, I think it's like really dispelling that myth. And then also the myth of like, you're doing it alone. We have just realized as, you know, with Pluey that women are just so willing to help you along the way. And we have had other female founders coming out of the woodwork. Like, how can we help you? We have like almost weekly meetings with other female founders at this point that we've been introduced to. And, and then, you know, women that aren't starting their own business, but, you know, people reach out to us on Instagram or LinkedIn, like, what can we do to help? Like, there is just this beautiful spirit and community, like women want to see other women succeed. Like there were books. I remember when I was in my twenties and there were so many books, like she wins, you win of like female mentorship, like let's break down this competitive female community. And just, I've seen it, this big shift over the last couple of years of, you know, truly like the, the, the barriers have come down. The competitive environment has been, you know, basically like blown up and it's just, it truly is like that camaraderie and how can we support you? And Addie and I, we have this wonderful mission that, you know, hopefully like Pluey succeeds and then we want to be available, whether it's financially or just with our time for other women um, who want to go down this path. Yeah, I think, you know, I love seeing on social media and articles about like women being underfunded, right, and undersupported because it's becoming more at least people are starting to understand that more like, wow, I can't believe only X percent of VC capital is going to female founders. And like, I think people are starting to talk about it more, but then there's also something about that that's intimidating. And I'm finding almost like, I hate to say not true because it is the stats are true, but it's like similar to like, as it's cool to be a woman, like, and women love women. And there's a lot of money out there for women. If you have a good idea and a strong, like, you know, pitch deck. And I think it's actually, um, you know, again, it's like, I think it's good. That's coming to light how, how challenging it's been for women to raise money and to start companies and that it's really good to talk about it. But then there's also part of it that's like a little intimidating that I would say is a myth. It's like, if you have a good idea and you're a strong woman, there are a ton of women out there that want to support you. There are funds dedicated for women. um, And I think that's just something, I don't know, to to tell people that it's like, there's money out there for women um, and, and from all funds, but yeah, there's a little bit like, it's, it's like, it's a good and bad thing that it's all kind of being talked about on social media and stuff. But our experience has been like women love women, entrepreneurs, they're helping each other. It's cool to be female founded, like use that hashtag. It is, I think, really actually empowering um, and actually a differentiating, you know, I think it's really bold and cool to be female founders and not have a male on our team, which is nothing against that. Of course, I think as we grow, we'll certainly bring men on too, but it's like, I don't know, there's something really actually powerful about it because it makes us, you know, stronger together. Yeah, it's really cool. I think it's awesome what you guys are doing. I really appreciate you both taking the time to have this conversation. We'll have to do a part two since yes. we got cut a little bit <laughs> a little bit short. Um, before we go, where is the best place to send people to find more about what you guys are up to? Yes, you can go to our website, which is hellopluie.com. 
and follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn. Instagram is hello underscore Pluey. Um, but you can follow us along as we show where we're installing new partnerships uh, and hopefully coming to a city, a location near you. Well, I wish you both amazing luck on this journey. And I want to hear more about it as it unfolds. Thank you again, Addie Britt, for, for taking the time to have this conversation. It was really fun. Thank you, Thank much. you. It's an honor to be here. Got a cool story to share? Hit me up at MikeCav.com. That's M-I-K-E-K-A-V.com. Don't forget to give this a like, review on Apple Podcasts, and share it with people. It makes a huge impact and helps keep it going. But above all else, lead your movement.